This is April 11th, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Nicholas Paganella. Welcome, Nick. Hi, how are you? Good. How about yourself? Oh, pretty good. Good. May I ask when you were born? I was in the barn on a nice wintry morning on November 27th in 1933. And where were you born? Uh, Marlboro. And what is your, uh, where do you currently live? I live in the town of Framingham. Okay. How long have you been there? Uh, 30 years now. Okay. Time goes by fast. It does indeed. Marital status? I'm married 56 years. Congratulations. She's going to go straight to heaven. Mm -hmm. Do you have children? Two. Stephen and, Stephen and Lisa. And grandchildren? Uh, five. Yeah. Great grandchildren? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. No, yeah. Where and when did you enter the military? Well, I originally entered it in the Massachusetts National Guard in January 1952. But uh, I applied for active duty mm -hmm. in uh, 1954. At that time, you needed the GI Bill. To get the GI Bill, you had to be on active duty. There was no Montgomery Bill or anything uh, afforded to anybody in the reserves unless you were deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, you know, 50 years ago. So things have changed through the years as far as eligibility for the GI Bill. And I wanted to get the GI Bill before it ran out mm -hmm. or the uh, qualifications ran out. Okay. Why did you join at the time? Well, that's that was the, GI that was Bill. the reason why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to get the GI Bill. That was one reason, the main reason. Okay. Uh, where, did you graduate from Marlboro High School? Yes, 1951. Mm -hmm. 1951. Yeah, 60 uh -huh. years ago. Wow. Yeah, it's right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Any reunions planned? They had one uh, 10 years ago, but that was 50 years, and now it's 60, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's too many people that are rambunctious to get it started. Okay. What was it like growing up in Marlboro? Uh, similar to Natick and Framingham, a small town. Uh, everybody knew each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of uh, immigrants mm -hmm. from uh, Greece, Italy, uh, Poland, Russia, living on the street. We knew all each other. We all knew each other, and uh, of course, it's changed now to considerably, but. That's the mm -hmm. way it is at that time, and uh, it was all small town America. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you remember about the Second World War? I remember I was 11 years old, and when it was over, I was riding a bicycle and uh, coming down Bolton Street, which is Route 85 in Marlboro, and there was traffic and horns blowing and people out in the streets, and it was just, at 11 years old, I was lucky enough to, re old enough to remember the jubilation that mm -hmm. came with that conflict that lasted well, say four years for the, uh, the United States, but about six or seven years for the other countries. And uh, incidentally, I watched uh, Netflix. I just got that, and I watch a lot of the documentaries of World War II, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, most of it I uh, watched the Holocaust. And it's, it's just, I can't think of a word, that I want to say outstanding, but it's not outstanding. It's just, it's just remarkable how some people even survived it. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, uh, I, if anybody's looking at this tape, I recommend they look at the Holocaust. You'll really see behind the scenes what it was all about, what human beings can do against other human beings. It's just atrocious. Right. Well, let's get back to you and <laughs> going for the GI Bill back in 1952. What branch did you join? The uh, United States Army. I transferred from the National Guard, Massachusetts, to mm -hmm. active duty on an extended active duty. They call it EAD. It meant to extended active duty, so that I had to take a, a re-enlistment in the guard time, so that my enlistment would, uh, uh, the two years that I applied for an active duty would extend and be inside the window of my uh, National Guard uh, uh, enlistment. And then, and then when I get out on a, on the regular 214 that was instituted about the time of the Korean War, uh, I was transferred in the remarks column back to the Massachusetts National Guard. Mm -hmm. So I was on, I was lend lease from the National Guard to the mm. Army. Okay. And uh, was the Army the only option, or did you have a cho choice? Well, it was, it was, it was there other options, but uh, you could not go in. At the time, I had a corporal rank, which was E4, mm -hmm. and at that time, it was about $40 more a month, and uh, you had some privileges. 
So uh, I went that route okay. rather than go uh, in the other branches. If you went in the other branches, you would start off from scratch, so to mm -hmm. speak. And did family or friends join the service when you did? No, no, nobody. And where were you sent for basic training? Fort Dix, New Jersey. Tell us what that was like. A lot of running, a lot of uh, testing to see how much endurance you had, either physically and mentally. Uh, the food was great, but they only gave you 10 minutes to eat it. And uh, it was, some of the discipline, I think, was pretty tough in that you had to eat everything that you took. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it made sure that your, your eyes weren't bigger than your stomach. Mm -hmm. And uh, in comparison to some of the, uh, the other branch, like the Marines, I don't think that discipline was that hard. Mm -hmm. I've uh, studied the Marine Corps and I've done some taping down there at Paris Island with my Veterans Corner TV program. And, uh, uh, let me tell you, they are the strictest and for a reason. But we'll get back to the Army okay. and me. <laughs> get back to the Army and you. Yeah. Anything else that you liked or disliked about BASIC besides having great food but only 10 minutes to eat it? Well, you had to, be make, sh you had to make sure what was on the agenda for the next day. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had to make sure you get a good night's sleep. And that wasn't too, too difficult because they didn't let you get to bed till 11 and they woke you up at 4. Mm -hmm. And th that isn't too, too bad considering getting back to the Marines, they gave you about two hours. Mm -hmm. we, they, used, they used to at least gave us the Army four or five hours. Very I'm not pushing the Marines, <laughs> but I'm just throwing that in. Very generous of the Army. Yeah. Now, did you receive advanced or specialized training beyond basic? Yes, I, I uh, went to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds and I was uh, attached to the Ordnance uh, Department, Ar Ordnance Corps. Mm -hmm. And I was in parts identification. The school I went to was in parts identification. And I was uh, mm -hmm. in this, when I went to Korea, I was in the 707 Ordnance, which is part of the 7th Infantry Division. Now tell us what that was like, parts identification. Well, at the time, at the end of the war, they had piles and piles of equipment there. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to salvage anything that was worth salvaging to save taxpayers' money, even mm -hmm. in the 50s. And uh, we were, so, so to speak, trained to somewhat identify at least what category it was in, whether it was on a, a gun howitzer or binoculars mm -hmm. or a rifle or a part of a tank or part of a, a trailer or a truck or something. And we kind of shaped it down and funneled it down into certain categories. Mm -hmm. I only served there, the, the tour was 16 months. I only served there for 12 months and then I transferred for the last four months up on the line duty a line outfit which was mm -hmm. on the DMZ, which is an abbreviation for the demilitarized zone, mm -hmm. the 38th parallel, which was, is a dividing line between North and South Korea even today, 60 years later. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, when were you, uh, when did you go to Korea? Uh, April of 54, no, April 55. April 55. Yeah. And then August of 56. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were first with the 707th, and then you were on line duty right. at the DMZ. Yeah. What was it like uh, serving on the DMZ? Well, to put it plainly, they looked at us and we looked at them. Mm -hmm. And the DMZ is a two mile of wide stretch of no man's land, a neutral area, fenced off. It's been improved a lot in the last 30, 40, 50 years mm -hmm. uh, at that time that the uh, South Korea uh, was actually separated geolog geographically uh, from North Korea mm -hmm. by that two mile uh, neutral zone. And uh, it's still effective today. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there, uh, the end of the war, actually, it wasn't the end of the war, it was actually the end of the conflict, where it was an oral agreement between both sides. And even today, it's not really a, an official end of the war, an armistice. It, uh, to me, it can't be termed an armistice because we're still at war over there. Uh, both sides just get fed up, so to speak, tired, and said, let's stop right here. Mm -hmm. And evidently, so far, both sides are somewhat happy with what it is, at least if, if they're happy with it, that they won't want to go to a combat type of situation, I think. That's my <laughs> personal opinion. Right. Aside from looking at them and them looking at us, were you ever in direct com um, conflict or combat with the enemy? Well, it, <clears throat> one night we were on duty. Mm -hmm. uh, I was two uh, Latino boys from Puerto Rico and myself, 
and we were uh, surprised by North Koreans who slipped under, they have little tunnels that they slide under. Mm -hmm. At that time it was crude because it was only in a, a year, a few months after the war, and uh, they crawled under and uh, uh, got the bead on us, so to speak, and we were surprised and they, they took our rifle and our uh, uniforms. And uh, basically the only thing that happened was, that happened that saved us, so to speak, if there was gonna be any more uh, violence, you might say, or started, is that they heard our uh, relief coming. Mm -hmm. And technically speaking, your relief is not supposed to say a word. But they were arguing about the St. Louis Cardinals were going to beat the Minnesota Twins or something like that, and blah, 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 blah. And of course, the North Koreans heard this, blah, 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 and they took off. And then when the people came, our re replacement from our, from our guard uh, unit, they laughed and said, what are you guys doing? This was in January. What are you guys doing? No clothes, no weapon. What's going on? Of course, they had laughed for a minute. Of course, we were terrified. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we couldn't speak at all. And they gave us a poncho and brought us back to the uh, headquarters there. And uh, the uh, company commander was a, uh, a West Point graduate. He was a captain. And of course, he was making a career of the military. Mm -hmm. So he was looking for major. And uh, if this happened on his watch, uh, his chances of getting major were very, very nil because everything rolls downhill. So mm -hmm. he was vilifying us. He was you know, cursing and banging and this and that. And he was concerned about his own promotion. So what he did is he transferred all three of us right then and there to three separate units and he covered the whole thing up Whoa. because, oh yeah, well, he didn't want to have it in the morning mm -hmm. report because then it would have ruined his career. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so, uh, uh, technically speaking, uh, there's no record of it, and uh, that was the reason why uh, mm -hmm. there was no record he was trying to do that. And uh, he, would, uh, he was trying to protect himself, and consequently, we got protected, because if you had lost your rifle at that time, it was pretty well known knowledge that uh, you'd probably spend some time in Leavenworth, because your rifle was part of you. And, uh, if you lose your rifle, it's just like a hockey player without a hockey stick. You're, more, you're, you're skating around looking like a, a dummy. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was an unfortunate incident. An incident it still stays with me sometimes today. When you wake up and you, where are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, some of those th some, some things that happen to you, uh, you try to erase and keep out of your mind. As the years have gone by, it's helped me a little bit to, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. Any other incidents in Korea? Any other stories, characters? Well, uh, not, I don't remember too many characters, but uh, uh, I remember that we, when we were in ordinance, uh, I was in the major items uh, department. A major item would be a truck or a jeep or a cannon or a, one whole particular unit of, of, of equipment. For instance, a, a movie camera along with a tripod, along with the lights, that would be the major item mm -hmm. with all its accessories. It wouldn't just be a tire mm -hmm. or a, a firing pin or a, or a one glass of a goggle, a, a binoculars would be the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I remember we used to drive down with one truck with maybe 20 drivers loaned from different line outfits. They'd come down, different two or three from each unit. We'd end up with 20 or so. And we'd drive down there with one truck and we would actually sign off and the vehicles were getting repaired in Japan and bring them, mm -hmm. bringing them back over to Korea because there was a higher echelon of ordnance at the time. Mm -hmm. The things that they could repair in, in Korea were not as extensive or uh, and uh, progressive enough that they had to send them back to Japan where the facilities were, uh, could uh, provide that type of repair. So once they were repaired, they'd come back to us and then we'd assign each truck uh, driver and we'd drive them back up all the way through the dirt roads and mm -hmm. dust in the villages all the way up uh, more toward the north. Mm -hmm. uh, our uh, base camp at the audience was probably two miles away or three miles away from the DMZ at that time. 7th Infantry Division uh, maybe left there in, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's some remnants maybe, uh, I don't know if the 2nd Division is there now. It's a, a patch with an Indian on it, a black Indian pa patch type. I don't know, I think maybe the 2nd Division may be in uh, Afghanistan. I don't really mm -hmm. know what units. And, but, and, then, and to bring up the modern mm -hmm. uh, American soldier, uh, they are not on the DMZ now. Uh, they're all pulled back 
maybe 20 or 30 miles where the, mm -hmm. the ROC, ROK, the Republic of Korea, Southern Korea uh, forces are ca carrying the blunt of their uh, uh, defense for their own country. Mm -hmm. I want to introduce the fact that the Koreans, South Koreans, especially the older generation, are very, 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 uh, show a lot of gratitude to the Americans mm -hmm. uh, and the American soldiers, et cetera, Marines, et cetera, or anybody that served in the Korea. And how they do that is they have a, a every three months, they have a maybe a 300 quota, 300 uh, uh, veterans that served in Korea are invited back to go to Korea, mm -hmm. all expenses paid. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the only country that I know of that uh, uh, shows gratitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to mention any other names <laughs> or countries, but uh, they do have gratitude because uh, I think South Korea is the 11th, 11th uh, gross national product of the free world, if you want to call it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've come a long way. And I've seen, I've attended reunions in Washington, D.C. of the Korean War veterans, and the Koreans in the United States show different things that's going on in Korea now, and their infrastructure and their technology is as equal or better than ours. Mm, really? From what I've mm -hmm. noticed, they are a leading uh, contributor of electronics, uh, mm -hmm. the Koreans. Okay. And did you ever um, receive or send letters home? Yeah, we yeah. sent letters home. I remember when I got there early enough that we just wrote free, F-R-E-E, -E, on, the, on, the, <laughs> the, on the envelope and it went. But after a couple of months, they stopped that. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the postage was three cents or five cents at that time. Of course, three cents was a lot of money. Gasoline was only 20 cents a gallon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, houses were uh, uh, maybe $9,000 okay. at that time. And how long were you in Korea again? Uh, 16 months. 16. That was a tour. Okay. Yeah, 16 months. I think it's only 12 now. But if you're in the modern army now, if you're over there and you have dependents, uh, your wife or children or, or spouse, uh, I think it's uh, two years now. I think it is two years. It may be wrong, but I think mm -hmm. it's a little longer if you have dependents mm -hmm. there. So when did you leave Korea? Uh, August of 56. August 56. Was that the end of your um, army career? Well, I transferred back to the National Guard for mm -hmm. 10 months, and then I had a, I, I didn't go to drill after that, mm -hmm. uh, and I was inactive. At that time, you had to have eight years of uh, obligation. Every, every male, 18 years of age, older, had eight years of obligation, and you could do it with a combination of active duty, or active reserve, or guard time, or uh, after you serve some type of active duty or reserve active time, uh, you could serve the a remainder three or four years in a, a control group. A mm -hmm. control group was nothing more than a, a list of names and how they could get a hold of you if they needed you right away. Right. But you mm -hmm. didn't uh, attend any type of drills. It didn't get paid for it. It wasn't good for your toward your retirement. What happened is 21 years later, 21 years later, I uh, with the GI Bill, I ended up in teaching. I'd use a GI Bill for hairdressing. I owned my own beauty shop in Marlboro, and they came to uh, uh, with an urban... Uh, Urban Renewal came with a, a eminent domain and took the beauty shop, and I had the option of getting a ten thousand dollars tax free from the uh, HUD, mm -hmm. Housing and Urban Development, or I could get relocated. And I took the ten thousand dollars and went back to school, and a second choice for the GI Bill, and I went to Fitchburg State full time, mm -hmm. and I got my teacher's uh, bachelor's and master's, and ended up at Keefe Tech in in Framingham, and I. Uh, taught at Keefe Tech for 32 years. I uh, was an industrial arts major at Fitchburg State, uh, and I got hired as an industrial arts teacher at Keefe Tech. But uh, after two years, I was asked to go upstairs and uh, transfer to cosmetology, and mm -hmm. I transferred to hairdressing, and I was in that department for about 17 years, and then I transferred back down to uh, the industrial arts pre-vocational mm -hmm. in the last five or six years that I was there. So uh, that I'll, was quite an experience too. I can well imagine. So you um, say August fifty six National Guard. So you were uh, you went to a beauty you owned the beauty shop in Marlboro. What were the years on that? Uh, Sixty four to seventy. I'm pretty sure. Seventy. Seventy. Yeah. Pretty interesting time to own a beauty shop. Well, it was very very good. It was very uh, lucrative because at that time uh, it was the end of the uh, the permanent wave. It was end of the uh, the teasing. It was the end mm -hmm. of uh, 
of the society that uh, if they went to church, when they did go to church, and they went to church mm -hmm. often, they would always get their hair done. Mm -hmm. It was a habitual type of thing where styles changed and, uh, and uh, rigidity and styles and, and dress as well as hair dressing was, it changed a lot, mm -hmm. considerably. But that was a good time because it, after that you had to uh, branch into different other things if you had a beauty shop or a mm -hmm. hairdressing shop. And okay. then uh, what happened was that when I transferred up to Keefe Tech, uh, I was there about three years and I ran into a, a Joe Noberini who was a, a fable boy who lived right next door to my uh, wife at the time when she was single. And he knew me and he says, hey, Nick, he says, uh, uh, you were in the military? I says, yeah. He says, well, you were over in Korea? I said, a couple of years there. And I said, the active, and I had three years in the guard time. He said, well, you got five years. He says, how old are you? I said, 43. He says, oh, he says, you, you're young enough to get 15 more years in, and you'll have 20 years before 60 years of age. So I said, well, my brother spent 26 years in the military. He was World War II, mm -hmm. and my godfather spent 20 years. He was retired. He was a crew chief in the 8th Air Force and all that. And I knew, I knew the retirement was pretty lucrative, or at mm -hmm. least, you know, you didn't get rich on it. it was It was nice to pay a heating bill when mm -hmm. you're 65 or 70 years old. So I said, oh, that's good. So I took a, a year. They said, take one and try it. They were looking for prior service people because at that time in the 70s, a lot of people after the Vietnam War, they were jumping out and they mm -hmm. were looking for bodies. And they liked people that had some experience. And of course, I was from the old school, so I had a somewhat of a firm footing. We were disciplined a different way, grew up differently. And uh, so uh, I tried one year and I was there for 10 months and I went to a, my company commander, I got permission to talk to him. I saluted him and he says, what can I do for you, Aganella? And I says, uh, I said, my time in a year is going to be up in two more months. I said, uh, if you give me sergeant, I says, I'll sign it for three more years. I was throwing him a little clicker and, and, he, and I said, you know, I says, this, I'm not boasting. I said, but there's some people in the drill shed floor that uh, I'm as equal to and maybe in case some places even better, I says, and they're carrying higher stripes than I am. Mm -hmm. And I says, uh, you know, yes, says, uh, Captain, I says, uh, you, to play in the band, you have to blow your own horn. He says, Paganella, he says, you'll see the orders if they come, and when they come through, I know that you fall, follow through with your three-year enlistment. So I got the sergeant stripes, I put in for the three, and that gave me nine years. Mm -hmm. And after nine years, I said, well, I'm almost over the hill mm -hmm. for the part way of the 10 years. I says, so I went for the whole 20 years. I ended up with about 25 years total time with my, my National Guard time, active duty uh, was, totally 25 years. And I got the retirement, it gets to you, you get a, a monthly check at 60 years of age. Depending on, a, it's, a, it's a formula depending on your rank, your rank and the amount of time that you spent, and it's a point system. You get a point for each drill you come uh, you have, or each day of active duty you have a point. And you get an automatic 15 points for being a member of the guard. Or, uh, so the guard has, keeps a pointy tabulation of your active duty time and all the time you spend with them. If you take a, 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 a courses, a correspondence courses, and you finish it, you get mm -hmm. a certain amount of points for that. Mm -hmm. If you do extra duty, extra camps, so to mm -hmm. speak, extra 15 day active duty time, come time. In my unit, when I was in Framingham, they always asked for uh, people to do extra time because we were support people for other places, for trucks or, or anything we needed. We were support people at the time. I was an ordinance. So, uh, uh, the point system is the amount of points multiplied times your, uh, your uh, rank gives you a certain figure divided by 12 and that's what you get for a monthly check. And also what happened, luckily when I just, I just fell into it, you might say I had, you might say I had pants with, with cups in them mm -hmm. and there was gold in the cups because when I shook them out the gold came out, G-O-L-D. And you may say, what do you mean? Well, the year that I retired, you had to be 60, when you were 60 years old, you automatically had to leave. Mm -hmm. and that was in 1993. Now, when I got that year, it so happened that the TRICARE for Life came into effect. And TRICARE for Life is an insurance program. And what it, it happens is how it, it is, uh, they went back to the World War II people and the, and the people that in World War II were orally 
promised that type of program. And they bargained for it, or you might say uh, negotiated for it, and for retention, in my opinion, for retention purposes, etc., and to keep a somewhat of a promise of World War II uh, veterans, they turned around and said, okay, we'll give you this TRICARE Life, which I explained it to you is, is really good because mm -hmm. it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any premiums and it doesn't have any co-pays mm -hmm. and you can go to any doctor, basically. And uh, really it's a windfall because gold in your cuffs mm -hmm. and I fell right into it and I didn't plan on it, but mm -hmm. sometimes you hit a home run without even going to the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you go to the ballpark with the best of players mm -hmm. and you can't win a game. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that sounds familiar. <clears throat> yeah. Well, the time of this taping, the Red Sox have just started their spring uh, all season, and uh, they had one of the best teams they've ever had on paper. They played 11 games, or is it nine games? Uh, nine 11 games. games. 11 two. games, and they only won two out of 11. Mm -hmm. So if you're winning only two games out of 11, uh, you're not a very good team, uh, considering <laughs> the, uh, what you have on the paper. Aside from your experience in the National Guard, did you join any um, organization like the American Legion? Well, I'm in the Legion. I'm in the uh, Korean War veterans. I was the uh, state commander of the Korean War veterans of Massachusetts for four years. Mm -hmm. I'm in the VFW life member. I'm a uh, associate member of the, Mass uh, the Jewish War veterans. I'm, uh, they mm -hmm. sent me to Korea. I know they sent me to Israel mm -hmm. for uh, all expenses paid. That's another story. And. Uh, I'm a member of uh, the Italian American War Veterans in Marlboro, and I think I forgot a few. But and the reason why I'm a member of all of them is because I write a column in the paper called Veterans Corner for the last six years in the Metro West Daily News, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I'm not selling it, but I'm telling you a story. And uh, by being a member of all of them, I can cull certain news that's going on and know mm -hmm. what's going on, so I can go with my video camera and videotape it for my uh, video TV access. Uh, programs in Marlboro, Framingham, Hopkinton, and Ashland. And mm -hmm. that's the reason why I would like to uh, uh, see where, and I asked the camera operator here, where uh, Pegasus was in Natick. And I tend to go on the third floor down there and uh, mm -hmm. see the, the uh, uh, Randy uh, Brewer and uh, mm -hmm. go from there. Excellent. And maybe get into Pegasus with the Veterans Corner TV access program that mm -hmm. I have. Let's reel it back a little bit. You mm -hmm. mentioned uh, you had a brother who served? Brother served in the United States Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. because the Army Air Corps was part of the Army until 1947. In 1947, two years after the war, they mm -hmm. went into the blue uniform and they were mm -hmm. called the United States Air Force. Okay. Now the Air Force is different than the United States Army Air Corps, which is C-O-R-P-S. Mm -hmm. It's not corpse, it's no, corps. No, 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 corps. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, the people in Washington know how to say it now. Because, okay. Now, and uh, he was in 26 years. He served in the uh, Burma, India area mm -hmm. era in uh, World War II. He's a draftsman, and he was in photo reconnaissance where the planes went over and took pictures, mm -hmm. and then they made maps of that photo mm -hmm. reconnaissance. And yeah. your brother's name was? John. Is? John, yeah. still around? Is he still around? Oh, no, he no. passed away about six years ago. I was already hear that. Yeah. And we he was in 26 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was out for a year, and they had a, a situation after World War II. They call it 5220. Uh, mm -hmm. And the 5220 meant 52 weeks, weeks in the year that you could collect $20 a month from the government. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was a VA or if it was directly from the, whatever it was. But, and uh, some of them get readjusted, they got $20 a, a week. It wasn't. Uh, I think the wage at that time was probably $60, but the $20 took the sting off of being unemployed. And a lot of them were, took a month or two or three to get adjusted, so they still got the $20. That they could buy bread and milk and, right. and mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, a year after, he went to my father, who was, my father was a nice guy, immigrant type of guy, but good. And he was kind of laid back. And mm -hmm. my brother went up and says, Pa, he says, I'm going to join the Army again. And my father gave him one word. He turned to him and said, goodbye, <laughs> meaning that's your choice. And he mm -hmm. stayed, I don't want to talk about my brother, but he had some great uh, assignments, Japan, mm -hmm. London, military advisory group in, uh, in uh, France and in mm -hmm. Germany. Uh, he really, really, really saw a lot of the country, he did. Mm -hmm. Get back to me. <laughs> Get back to you. Now, you, were, uh, you grew up in Marlboro. What made you choose Framingham? Well, that's a very interesting story because 
I told you about the beauty shop being taken by eminent domain, mm -hmm. and two years later, they had made this second main street in Marlboro to divert some of the traffic. Well, the HUD only made the second main street, but the second main street had no connector roads to go back into some main highways like 85, Route 85 going toward Hudson, or Route 20 going toward Northboro. So what the state did, two years later, the state came in with the Massachusetts uh, development, and they bought my house for eminent domain. They weren't as generous as the, uh, the federal. The federal government mm -hmm. took, in 1972 or 73, the, head, the, the federal government came in with, I don't know, six or eight million dollars at the time. And they took a lot of the property behind the Main Street in Marlboro, took the property and made a nice big thoroughfare called Granger Boulevard. Granger mm -hmm. Boulevard is named after uh, Granger, I forget, Francis Granger, who was a DPW uh, head for about 30, 40 years there. And they named it Granger Boulevard after him. And there was no great access roads, so they went down the a railroad bed. My house was right close to that. They mm -hmm. took the main railroad bed and took my house. So they said to me, Mr. Paganella, you're, they gave me a, a price. I got, it, mm -hmm. uh, I got separate uh, uh, appraisals and they were generous to, you know, they gave what the market was. And uh, I was to working at Keefe Tech. I was a teacher at Keefe Tech. My wife was a, a nurse at Leonard Morse, mm -hmm. living in Marlboro, didn't feel it seemed practical. And I said, well, let's move more toward our employment, which mm -hmm. is Natick of Framingham. I looked at some houses, houses in Framingham, but uh, in Natick also, and uh, we settled in Framingham in uh, mm -hmm. 1980, yeah, right. 30, 31 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been there ever since, yeah. And I've gotten pretty well established in the town. A lot of people mm -hmm. know me, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the way it goes. Okay. And you mentioned you had two children. Yes. Did either one of them go into the military? No, neither one. I told my, I have a son, Stephen, and a daughter, Lisa, and uh, Stephen, I told him way back in the uh, 70s, uh, after the Vietnam conflict was mm -hmm. over, I told him, I said, you're not a bad deal, it's not a bad deal, this and this and that, but at that time, none of the youngsters, even my neighborhood, even my God, uh, even my neighbor who spent 20 years, World War II, he had five sons and not a one of them went military. Mm -hmm. It was, in the 70s, it was a, it was a flower child and mm -hmm. they, and military was a bad news. And that's the reason why, in my opinion, why they eliminated the draft too, uh, also, is because I think being a volunteer force takes the pressure off of the college draft mm -hmm. age persons, and therefore you don't have all the riots that they had in the uh, contention mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Now, um, going back to your time in active duty and also National Guard, you also were serving during the Cold War era. Did you um, ever feel that one of these days you were going to go up against the big red menace? Well, that's another interesting question. Uh, about 1985, I was in the Framingham Guard Unit, and we were a uh, support uh, for petrol, uh, petroleum, and uh, delivering petroleum, delivering uniforms, delivering uh, ordnance and ammunition and food. Mm -hmm. And uh, Whitensville National Guard unit was a mechanized unit. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the, the government, uh, the Department of Defense, wanted to know how effective the National Guard units were in case of, the, if the balloon went up, if, mm -hmm. if the Russians came flying across uh, Eastern Germany. So I, I, I volunteered, five of us volunteered from the Framingham unit to get attached to the Whitensville unit and the whole operation consisted of the 50 states, including Hawaii and Alaska, mm -hmm. and each state was to send a contingent of appropriate uh, people and equipment over to Europe and defend that line. And it entailed getting the mechanized units, the tanks, the trucks, etc., onto flat rail cars, bringing it to Bayonne, New Jersey, put it on a, a transport ships, mm -hmm. bring it over to Amsterdam, and then tr trucking it all the way down from Amsterdam down into the Fulda Gap, F-U-L-D-A. Mm -hmm. The Fulda Gap was a, an area that was easily accessible th that 
the Russians or the, even both sides could go through it because they, there were regular flat plains there. Mm -hmm. On the north was the English and the French, and on the south, I don't remember who was on the south, but right in the middle of that line were the Germans and the Americans. We were shoulder to shoulder to the Tiger tanks of the German army. It's ironic that mm -hmm. maybe 10 or 20 years before that, they were our enemy, now mm -hmm. we're partners. Politics is a funny game. It is indeed. And you get <laughs> strange bedfellows. Mm -hmm. But anyway, and they were, they were crack. They were good. The Russian, I mean, the Germans were really good. They're very disciplined people. Great equipment, too. Anyway, the Fulda Gap, so we actually had uh, a three-week exercise, and they called it the Reforger, R-E-F-O-R-G-E-R. -E I forget what it means, but it's an acronym or abbreviation mm -hmm. for yeah. a, a, some type of a, a training uh, mm -hmm. episode uh, situation. And uh, that was the uh, extent of the Cold War when you asked the question, did you ever see that that would happen? And, and we knew that uh, that uh, that was our mission. I contemplated it took us a lot more than two or three weeks to even get the equipment loaded and over there and on that line. It seems to me that if the Russians really wanted to come through there, they probably would have been 400 miles behind that, beyond that, I should mm -hmm. say. But uh, that was the... Uh, the uh, mission and uh, it was a pretty cold type of thing and we, they wanted to see how our logistics was. An army is not good unless it has good logistics. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, I ended up in a hospital for two or three days. Uh, there was a 3,000 gallon uh, fuel tanker. Same ta the tankers, would be 18 wheelers to drive up to the gas stations and deliver the, the uh, uh, gasoline to our gas stations. The army has those. And we had a fellow there that didn't really know what he was doing. He was regular army. He pulled in levers, this and that. And finally, we had a four inch, we're on top of it, feeding from the tank truck over to our truck, which was a smaller 600 gallon type of receptacle. And the, there was a four inch pipe about this big. And all of a sudden, somebody pulled the lever and the whole thing come gushing out and flew oh, all no. over us. So I ended up in a hospital. It affected me somewhat, wash us down. We were, we were bathed in it, uh, diesel oil. But and the reason why I bring that up is because by uh, the day I get released back to the unit in Germany is a, a fellow from Whitensville, young kid, because I was, you know, I was in my 50s. This was in 1985. And uh, my uh, brother told me I was crazy. What are you doing this for? Will you come over here? I said, well, I want to say hello to you because he was stationed there. <laughs> and uh, he's, well, don't you ever do that. Anyway, getting back to the young fellow in uh, Whitensville, he was getting, he was actually from that unit from Whitensville, which I was attached to, and he was getting released after three or four days. And what happened with him was, he was ha driving an, an all-purpose vehicle, or all-purpose uh, vehicle, I guess, I forget names, but it was a track vehicle, has a back door where people are sitting uh, in a, a, a horizontal position, mm -hmm. and the back door opens up and they run out and run around it. They're, they're, it's a, uh, a mechanized type of uh, uh, machine. And anyway, he was the, the uh, driver, and he had eaten for a day or so, and he fell asleep. And uh, not eating and falling asleep, he lost conscious and hit a tree. And therefore, he got somewhat hurt. Not seriously, but mm -hmm. enough to have uh, medical attention. And uh, the reason why I bring that story up is that uh, logistics is very important. If somebody didn't do their job along the chain, that person didn't get food. And also, he didn't get adequate sleep. But the food is something like the MREs. Mm -hmm. And we had some form of that then in 85. I think they came out with it maybe around that time. Mm -hmm. The MREs are Meals Ready to Eat, which was uh, researched and developed mm -hmm. right here in, in the uh, Natick labs yep. of the Soldier Systems Center here in, in Natick. I'm very familiar with the uh, Soldier Systems Center, by the way. They, mm -hmm. they all know my face there, but I just mm -hmm. want to throw that in. Sure. Yeah. So uh, that, yeah, the, the logistics, again, I repeat, is, is very, very, uh, important. And uh, just taking Afghanistan and Iraq today in, 19, in 2011, if we don't have the, uh, the equipment on hand or the things that they need on hand, they're, they're just like a hockey player without a hockey stick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, before we wrap this up, is there anything else you'd like to say? Well, not on a military note, but I'd like to say that uh, I believe that this time that we're here on earth mm -hmm. is a trial period mm -hmm. 
and we're here for a reason. And I think that there's a veil, a V-E-I-L, a veil mm -hmm. between us that we can't see beyond that veil. But when we expire, mm -hmm. we do see beyond the veil. I'm prophesizing or preaching, but I believe that it's a trial period and someday uh, I'm gonna be asked a question. And I'm gonna wrap it up with this. A lot of times I'll tell, tell people this short little story. I say, you know, I prayed to my God a couple of months ago and I said to God, I says, I'm so busy, even in retirement and in my late 70s, I need 28 hours in a day. And the Almighty Father says to me, my son, I give you 24 hours just like everyone else. And with that, I said, well, who's going to argue with my creator? And spiritually, I walked away from him. And just then, he, I heard him say back to me, just a moment, my son, someday I'm going to ask you, what did you do with the 24 hours I gave you? I'm all done. You're all done. And I believe we're all done, too. Thank you, Nick Paganella, for your participation in this program. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.